In this lecture, we will study the basic primitives used to express parallel computations on the JVM. There are many forms of parallelism in the wild, from GPUs and custom parallel hardware over multiprocessors and multicore systems to distributed computer clusters. Each parallel programming model is tailored to a specific use case and has certain associated characteristics. In this course, we study a specific parallel programming environment. Still, we strive to be general. The ideas and algorithms that you will see in this course generalize to other models. We will specifically assume that we are running our parallel programs on multi-core or multi-processor systems with memory that is shared across processors. Second, our programs will run on the JVM runtime, which executes on top of an operating system of the host computer. What are the sources of parallelism in an operating system? Let's start by defining the most coarse-grained unit of parallel computation. First of all, we all heard about operating systems, but let's try to define them more formally. We will say that an operating system is a piece of software that manages hardware and software resources and schedules program execution. Windows, Linux and OS X are all examples of different operating systems. Most programs need an operating system to run. A process is an instance of a computer program that is executing inside the operating system. We define a process like this since the same program can be started many times. Each time a process is started and while it executes, the operating system assigns it some resources, such as execution time on a CPU, memory address space, file handles or network ports. Each process is assigned a unique process identifier PID once. For example, when we start SBT, a process with a unique PID is created to execute the SBT program. For example, PID 834. However, while SBT is running, we are not limited to a single instance. We can open another terminal and start another SBT process. From the parallel programming standpoint, a process is the most coarse-grained unit of concurrency on a shared memory system. The operating system multiplexes many different processes on a finite number of CPUs. Each process executes for a small amount of time on a CPU before getting replaced by another process. This time interval is called a time slice and the mechanism is called multitasking. Finally, it is important to note that two processes cannot read or write each other's memory directly. Each process owns a separate, isolated memory area. This property is important from the standpoint of security. Since one process cannot access another process's memory, it cannot steal its data or corrupt it. For us, this property means that processes cannot easily communicate. Although operating system primitives such as pipes allow two processes to exchange information, inter-process communication is usually not lightweight or straightforward. We therefore have another, more fine-grained programming primitive. Each process can contain multiple independent concurrency units called threads. There are two main benefits of using threads. First, threads can be started programmatically from within the program, making it easier to structure parallel computations than it was with processes. Second, and more importantly, threads share the same memory address space. This enables them to exchange information by reading from and writing to memory. Each thread has a program counter and a program stack. The program stack is a region of memory that contains a sequence of method invocations that are currently being executed. The program counter describes the position in the current method. Threads that are executing on the JVM are specific in the sense that they cannot modify each other's program stacks. Stack entries 
which correspond to local variables in the method are only accessible to the thread that owns the stack. To communicate, JVM threads must modify heap memory instead. When a JVM process is run, it also starts several threads, the most important of which is the main thread. This thread executes the main method of a Scala program. In a normal sequential program, we only use the main thread to execute the program. However, in a parallel program, we must start several additional threads to parallelize our computation. The operating system then assigns our threads to available CPUs. Starting an additional thread proceeds in three steps. First, we need to declare a custom thread subclass. This subclass will define the code that the new thread must execute. Second, we must instantiate an object of that subclass, which will track the execution of that thread. Finally, we call the start method on that object to start the actual thread execution. Note here that the same class can be used to create and start many instances of that thread subclass. Let's study this on a concrete example. We define a thread called hello thread and override its run method. The code inside the run method will define what the thread instance executes. In this case, we just print a hello world message. We then create the new thread instance t and call the method start to start the thread. To then wait for its completion, we need to call the method join. On a figure, this looks as follows. When the main thread calls start, a new thread of type hello thread is started. The two threads then execute in parallel. When the main thread calls join, it blocks its execution until the hello thread completes. After the hello thread completes execution, the main thread can continue executing. Let's see a demo. For the purposes of the demo, we will use SBT and the interactive Scala shell. To write down our snippet, we will enter the special paste mode, which makes it easier to write multiple lines. To run the thread, we create a new thread instance T of type hello thread, and then we call the start method. In the end, we call join to wait for its completion. Let's try a slightly different example. This time, we separated the printing of the hello world message into two statements, hello and world. We then define a method that runs two such threads in parallel. Let's run this method main several times and see what happens. It seems that the first time we ran the main method, the two threads ran serially to each other, one after another. First, one thread printed hello world, and then the second thread did the same. Let's run it again. It seems that this time an alternative scenario happened. The first thread managed to print the hello part of the message, but then the second thread kicked in. It also printed hello before the first thread managed to print out world and then the both threads completed. The previous demo showed that the different separate statements executing in two threads can overlap arbitrarily. This is expected. After all, the two threads execute in parallel. However, we sometimes want to ensure that a sequence of statements executes at once, as if they were just one statement. Here, we want to make sure that two such sequences in two different threads can never overlap. Either T or S executes all of these statements first. In concurrent programming, we call this atomicity. An operation is atomic if it appears as if it occurred instantaneously from the point of view of other threads. Let's study in more detail why atomicity is important on an example of a method called getUniqueID. When invoked by some thread, this method must return a unique integer number. In other words, when a thread calls getUniqueID, 
the value it gets is not returned to any other thread. We implement this method by keeping a private UID count field and then incrementing the field in the method before returning its value. Let's see a demo of how this works. We start by defining a private UID count variable. We then define the getUniqueID method. We then define a method which starts a thread that uses getUniqueID. This thread will call getUniqueID to get 10 unique IDs and then print them to the standard output. We will start two such threads and see what happens. The set of numbers obtained in the two threads are not at all unique. In particular, the numbers 10 and 1 repeat in both threads. As we saw in the demo, the getUniqueID method does not execute atomically. Separate statements in its body can interleave arbitrarily when executing on different processors. As a consequence, invocations of getUniqueID do not return unique values. For example, a thread could first read UID count. After that, it adds the value 1 to it. But before the actual assignment takes place, the second thread does the same thing. If both threads now execute the assignment, they will both write the value 1 back into UID count. As a result, when they read UID count, they both return 1. To prevent such scenarios, both Java and Scala come with a synchronized construct, which helps enforce atomicity. Code in the synchronized block that's invoked on the same object is never executed by two threads at the same time. The JVM ensures this by storing something called a monitor in each object. At most one thread can own a monitor at any particular time. For example, if a thread T0 owns a monitor on an object X, another thread T1 cannot acquire that monitor before T0 releases it. Let's look at how this works. The synchronized method must be invoked on an instance of some object. In our example, we instantiate a symbol object X of the type anyref. We declare a private UID count variable as before and define a method getUniqueID that increments UID count and returns it. Note that this time the code inside the method is surrounded with the synchronized block on object X. The method getUniqueID now works correctly. To verify this, start your own SBT instance and repeat the steps that we did before, this time with a synchronized statement.